I'm so excited to have my peer mentor and colleague, Shade Curry, with me today. So just a few years ago, when I started to give these really amazing, use, valuable negotiation workshops, Shade sat me down and she like gave me a reality check that was so tremendously useful. And it has, you know, the workshop, actually, you could hear the recording on this podcast. You could hear excerpts of that on this podcast, and I'll link to it in the show notes. But she was so useful and so helpful to me. And she's also given me such amazing feedback when I had heartbreak in my life because of a, you know, um, a dating situation that had gone sideways. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. So Shade, welcome to Negotiate Your Career Growth Podcast. You help mission-minded women over 40 date after divorce. Yes, yes, yeah. I do. And thank you for having me, Jamie. It's such a pleasure to be here. And yeah. I do remember that conversation yeah. around your work and you were just kind of like wanting some feedback. And I was like, oh my gosh, I wish I had you when I was... <laughs> When I was in corporate, I like every situation you were talking about, I was like, oh my God, that was me. I have an example of that. I have an example of, mm. of all of that. So yeah, so the work that you do is so, so needed, so important in the world. It's interesting, like looking back, I was like, I wonder if I would have stayed in corporate if I'd had a coach mm. like you, if I have, could have made my career go where I originally wanted it to go. Who knows? But we'll never know. <laughs> Actually, I'd love for you to take us on your journey. How did you become a, a coach who helps women over 40 date after divorce? Like maybe you can walk us through your journey from working in corporate. Oh, actually, you know, tell us where you come from. Tell us yeah. a little bit more about your background. Yeah. So I grew up in Nigeria. Um Born here Immigrant in the United like States. Me. Yes, born in the United States. Yeah. Went to Nigeria when I was itty bitty, like two. Grew oh. up there. So for all practical purposes, my entire um, programming and socialization is Nigerian. My parents are Nigerian. Mm. And so I came back to the United States when I was 21. Uh, mm. Married to my first husband at the time. Mm. And um, really all I knew of the United States was pictures in our photo album and then TV. Mm. <laughs> and when I arrived, it didn't, my experience was not like TV <laughs> at all. I have the same experience as you, Shade. I was born in South Korea and then I immigrated to America when, when I was almost eight, seven turning eight. And I remember all of my mental images about America was Disney, Paradise and Hollywood musicals. And I arrive, I'm like, oh, wait, this isn't TV. This is Reality is not Hollywood. <laughs> I felt like Americans were the friendliest people on earth. And to some degree, American culture is very friendly, yeah. but it's also very surface. Mm. Like I so I, I knew people would embrace, oh, how are you? And, you know, there was a lot of like, hello, how are you? Mm -hmm. But not so much, hey, let's have tea. Let's have coffee. Hey, let's do lunch. Hey, mm. Let me introduce you to my friends. That was just so I noticed that I was at work, in contact with people at church, in the community, but it never went deep. And coming from a culture where there was a lot of community, there was a lot of deep community, in fact, almost sometimes too much, where people get way into your business more than they should. It was very jarring. And I think I didn't know this at the time. I think I've kind of done some of the work after the fact to process my quote unquote immigrant experience and realize that there was a lot of, um, I, I don't want, want to use the word trauma because it, you know, it wasn't like the big T trauma, but I think there was like this chronic um, underlying hum of disconnection that I was experiencing. Mm. Uh, I would say the first, um, probably the first 10 to 15 years of returning. I've been here, back here 25 years now. The first 10 to 15 years, there was a hum, an underlying hum of disconnection that I didn't know was there. Mm. Um, it was very disconnected community-wise, very lonely, but yeah. I didn't feel an acute loneliness. You know, so it's it's this so it thing that's like happening chronic. to you. It was chronic, mm -hmm. but I didn't even feel it because mm -hmm. there was no 
outward indicator that I should, that I could be lonely or that I didn't have friends because I had friends, but those friends were not, those friendships were not deep and they were not um, open. They weren't, there wasn't a lot of ability for me to open myself up and other people were not opening themselves up either. So there was a lot of, um, yeah. I would say <laughs> there were a lot of connection problems, but then I wasn't aware that what was happening was a connection problem. And how did that impact when you did enter into the workplace? How did that impact uh, your experience as somebody who is working in corporate? Yeah. Yeah. So my early experience in corporate uh, was a little bit, it was a journey. Um, you know, I, at this moment, I don't really know. I think I was just sort of disconnected from my experience. like Even through your early career? My early career. So definitely yeah. in my early career, because my early career was about the time. So I came, I came to the U S at 21, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of, you know how you kind of like have to transition your credentials. You got to show up your credentials, take some more classes so that everything matches. So, you know, the couple, two or three years. And then by the time I settled into corporate, I was about, I would say 23, 24. Mm -hmm. And so I started working, um, I worked in customer service. That was like my very first quote unquote proper job mm -hmm. was in customer service for Avis Rent a Car. Um, and I moved up really quickly. Um, I was a hard worker. So I moved up from like front customer service to international car rental service and would have gone on there. But then I um, I had gotten my uh, IT credentials at that point. Mm. And so I started working as a data analyst. Moved so you made a pivot. Now. I made a pivot. Yeah, yeah. I, I always knew I was going to make a pivot. I knew that like my customer service roles were just sort of like making money on the side while you take these classes so you can get a real job, which, you know, you know how we immigrants are. Customer service is not a real job. Mm. You got to be a professional. At least Nigerians are that way. You got to be a doctor, engineer, accountant, uh, you know, doctor. Lawyer? And I wasn't even any of those. Lawyer. I, I studied engineering, but I, I wanted to, I hated engineering. So I wanted to make a pivot to computer science, mm -hmm. which my dad didn't consider a real job either at that mm. time, you know, so, but that was kind of like, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. So um, then I got my first um, IT job data as a data analyst. I moved into programming, mm -hmm. then moved into business analysis. Um, and then at that point I started having children. So I had my first two children and they were, you know, so going from like age 23 to 28, five and four at the time. And things just became kind of hard, mm. you know, the working all day. And of course my relationship, you know, that ended in divorce was not uh, an egalitarian one. Mm. <laughs> we were not sharing duties equally at all. Mm. And he was not, um, he was not a very loving person. So all of that pressure was really hard. So about, about that time, I decided that I was going to quit work and stay home with the kids. And so I stayed home with my children for about, um, for about 10 years until the divorce. Uh, during that period, I was a foster parent for a while. My ex, I started, uh, actually started an IT training and contracting company, like freelance from home. And it grew to the point that my ex-husband was able to quit his job and kind of take it over. And so that, so that was about a 10 year period from 28 to 38, where I was just kind of like home with the kids, running the business that we started together, adopting kids, you know, just doing all the mom stuff. I had a purse with embroidered, that I embroidered. I don't know if you remember the 31 bags that were it was, a, there wasn't this uh, multi-level marketing business. I don't know if it still exists, but 31 was what it was called. And they sold you purses that you embroider things on it. And I had a purse that had super mom embroidered on it. So I really did identify very strongly with my role as a mother. I was very proud of it. Um, and an yeah. entrepreneur. And I didn't identify so much with the with being an entrepreneur. And but, so wait, 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 can I pause you for here for a second? Because I just want to make sure I'm tracking this because I heard that you started an I IT did. contracting business that grew so much that your ex-husband was able to like basically quit he his job. The, he quit his and job. Then he took it over. <laughs> yeah. But this is what being socialized as a woman will do. Mm. I didn't see it as my accomplishment. I didn't own it as my accomplishment. 
Mm. And he didn't own it as my accomplishment either. And in fact, whose accomplishment was it? Well, there you go. As I was just socialized to do things to make people happy. And mm. while I was at home and I was, you know, taking care of the kids, he didn't acknowledge that my contributions were significant. And I, because of my own internalized patriarchy and internalized op oppression, mm. felt like I wasn't doing enough. So I was like, okay, I'm not doing enough. I'm just sitting at home with these kids and cleaning the house and cooking. I really need to like do more. So I'll start this company. It was like this apology. So the identity from which I started it was more an apology for not making money, for not contributing can, to the household. Can I just, yeah. Can I just pause you here? And like, can you imagine that some, a business that is an expression of an apology is so successful? Well, this is how amazing women are. and We don't know it. Yeah. And there's so many people who are listening to this. so many women, so many working mothers who are listening to this and they're nodding their heads. Like, yes. Yes. I know what that feels. I can relate. You're, you're, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm being called out right now. You know, yeah, I'd imagine yeah. there are people like that. So then, and then what happened or what was the pivot, the pivotal moment that made you decide to become a coach helping right. women date better? So that came from my divorce. So that those mm -hmm. 10 years, um, mm -hmm. I was holding it all together with the marriage and the business and everything. And, and adopting, adopting, and kids, adopting and, kids. Wow. Just so much but work. So much. When you're with someone who is not uh, mature and is not loving and you just has their own, a lot of their own issues. And when you're like me, not owning my own brilliance and in many ways, codependent and dependent on my relationship for my validation. Mm. Um, you, you, you get to a breaking point. And the breaking point for me was that I started to see my, my, at this point, my kids were turning into teenagers and, you know, teenagers are, they, they become their own people. They want to be individuals. They talk back. And I saw my ex-husband starting to treat my daughter, uh, who was the oldest and my son somewhat, um, the same way I was being treated. So hmm. it's so sad that I was willing to accept that behavior but when I saw my children being treated that way, I was like, oh, this has got to stop. So I started setting some boundaries. He was not available for those boundaries. And so uh, he filed for a divorce. I was blindsided, but it really was a wake up call for me that my thinking, my mindset, the way I saw the world was not right. I was like, there's mm -hmm. something wrong with the way I'm seeing the world. And so after the divorce, I, um, I hired a coach. And I went to a 12 step program for codependency and I started reading all the books. And at that time, there wasn't one resource that put things in the context of marriage and divorce and, you know, uh, gender equality that solved all of my problems. And so as I started piecing everything together about what my, where my thinking was wrong, how I was oppressing myself, how I was accepting behavior that was not um, appropriate, I said, I got to put this together for divorced women or for women in uh, difficult marriages or women in abusive marriages, because they would have to read all these books <laughs> to get it. And that's how, that's why I became a coach. So after the divorce, I, I did go back to corporate for about five years mm -hmm. after my divorce, but I always knew I was going to help divorced women. So I went, I worked for one of the big four accounting firms for five years. And so a lot of my stories that I might tell around corporate <laughs> come from there because mm. I was looking at things from a very different lens at that point. Um, so that's why I decided to become a coach. So um, towards the end of my corporate time after the divorce, I started my coaching business. I got certified in trauma um, as a professional life coach and also as a feminist coach, which you and I did that together. And I started um, putting myself out there. Like I can help you if you're divorced, divorcing, thinking about divorcing, I can help you Signed my first, probably like 10, uh, divorce clients during that period. I started dating my now husband. Well, I was dating this whole time. So there's a lot, a lot of dating stories with people, not my husband. And then, um, I met my husband we kept our relationship off of social media. So people in the real world knew that we were dating, but we kept it off of social media and so when we got engaged, we announced it on social media. And I guess all of the people who had been following my marketing as a divorce coach saw that. And they were like, wait, what? <laughs> you might, you found someone? You're getting married? 
I want you to help me do that too. Mm -hmm. And so that really took my coaching business. It kind of sort of like, it was sort of the catalyst in my message and where I realized that, oh, most divorced women, not all, most divorced women really want to repair this uh, this broken part of their lives, quote unquote broken, because you know it was supposed to break because that guy wasn't right for you. Um, they really do want to do over. Many of them want to do over. And I think for many of us, that do over sort of represents that, okay, I wasn't the problem. I'm actually a good partner. I can actually handle a relationship. So I pivoted and decided to niche down a little bit further to help women date after divorce because there were other dating coach, uh, divorce coaches, many divorce coaches. And I was like, this, no one's taking care of the dating part of this. And I decided that I was going to raise my hand and be the person who did that. Love it. Love it. And so, you know, this is negotiate your career growth and your personal relationships, your romantic relationships, the divorce that you're going through, the dating that you do after divorce has an impact on your career as well, because these are all the different things that a woman, a modern woman has to, a woman has to um, balance in her life. And I'm, and I'm curious when you uh, helped women through their divorce. Did you also help them negotiate that divorce? Like negotiate yes. settlements? Yeah. Um, I didn't help them with, so there's a, there's a little niche in divorce coaching where, uh, so attorneys, maybe attorneys turn coaches mm. or actually help with the court part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have helped many women um, center themselves in the divorce. So yeah. a lot of what I have helped women with is asking for what they want. I literally yeah. I'm working with a woman right now who is in the process. So they're splitting up and it's somewhat amicable. And the process is for her to purchase her own home. He keeps the marital home and I'm coaching her on not choosing the smallest, tiniest, cheapest house she can find because of that. What, you know, not wanting to be a burden, not wanting to ask for too much, not wanting to be seen as wasteful. Mm -hmm. And I, I've had to like talk to her and say, Hey, you're making this choice, not just for you, but for your children. You know, you're going to, you want to choose a, a, a tiny house because you don't want to waste money or because you feel like you don't want to be too greedy, but the money in the marriage belonged to the both of you. Mm -hmm. It is your money too. And so, but that thinking is so deep, so ingrained that the money belongs to the man and the woman is dependent on him for it. Shifting that thinking in a very short amount of time for her to be able to sort of like take up space and purchase a home equivalent to the marital home or at least close to it can be a journey. It sounds like a no brainer, but when you've been programmed and socialized a certain way, um, you're probably going to ask for too little. Most women ask yeah. for too, I know I asked for too little in my divorce. I, you know, I, I settled for too little in my divorce. And so I'm, I'm on a mission to make sure other women don't do the same way, do, do the same thing. And that's exactly a similar pattern that too many women bring into their workplace negotiation, compensation negotiation, right? Because the way you do one thing in one other area of your life you see in different areas of your life. So if you're always settling for less or thinking, oh, I shouldn't have to, I shouldn't take up too much space or I shouldn't be greedy in a divorce settlement, right? That mindset might also be showing up in how you advocate for your pay, your raise, your your compensation. Oh, and I'm, I'm curious, yeah, have you seen your clients also translate that confidence that they gain through coaching with you, they gain through learning how to speak up and take up space in their divorce? And does that show up in other areas of their lives as well? Oh, yeah, shows up yeah. In so many areas. I think once they see that, oh, in this area, I wasn't advocating for myself. Mm. I wasn't self-championing. I wasn't self-protecting. I wasn't mm -hmm. expanding and growing. They start to notice that, oh my goodness, in my family, I'm the, <laughs> everyone just dumps their stuff on me mm. <laughs> and I just pick up all their problems and do the work to fix them. They notice where they've been enabling their children. They notice where they are settling for relationships that are um, not nourishing. They, they notice it in their friendships. They also notice it at work. Yeah. Right. They notice how they're up at 5 a.m. sending emails to prepare for the day <laughs> and then coming home. <laughs> after work, eating a quick dinner, 
and then getting back to work to be able to prove themselves. They notice that they are um, never able to absorb the joy of their accomplishments. Like they'll knock something out of the park, but immediately the anxiety comes back up like, oh my God, now I got to do the next thing. Now I got to do the next thing. And so realizing that no, you're enough as you are, you're a hundred percent worthy, a hundred percent deserving of everything that you want and everything that your peers and coworkers are enjoying, you are deserving of that as well. And maybe even more, who knows? Yeah. And, and the thing that you mentioned about the, mar- you know, the marital um, assets, the money, it's like, we, we both own this together. And just like in the workplace, you are contributing value. Your work matters. Your work is just, just the fact that you're showing up on time. That's huge. That's yes. so much professionalism value already just there by you showing up and you doing your work, you're contributing mm. in a, in a real and significant way. So one of the comments that you made to me when you were giving me feedback on my uh, workshop material was about hypervigilance. Mm. And that I was like, oh yeah, you're right. Yes. And then I remember when you first said it to me, I had this like moment of clarity. I'm like, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about, especially if you're a woman of color. um, And, you know, if you've been exposed to the same gender socialization that Shade have been talking about, and I, I, I can relate to that too. Um, because pretty much all of us have experience or been influenced by patriarchy. And I'm just curious, you know, you, you would you tell me a little bit more about what that was like for you as you mm-hmm. were going through your divorce, right? Uh, becoming your own person and you're working in corporate. I, I heard you mentioned you worked at a big four accounting firm. Yeah. Maybe, maybe tell us a little bit more about what that hypervigilant experience was like for you. Yeah. So, um, and there are a lot of factors that played into my particular situation, but I think you'll recognize like a common experience Mm. in, in parts of it. So I, you know, I was going through a divorce at the time that I got the job. So I did come in with some anxiety. Like I had some anxiety going on from that, Um, which definitely exacerbated the hypervigilance by itself. So other people may not experience it to the height that I did, but it's definitely there because I think my other coworkers also experienced something similar. Um, So coming in, you know, into a company that's like, you know, just this, we just had, you know, we were like stars in the, in the, in the corporate world. Like you, you mentioned the name of the company you work for and everyone gives you a second glance, like, dang, you know, that's amazing. Um, as a woman and as a woman of color socialized to feel like I'm not quite good enough, Mm. a little bit of not, I don't necessarily think of it as imposter syndrome, but a little bit of, I feel like it's just internalized oppression, having received the messages over the years that you're not quite good enough um, coming in. And then I'm, I guess I'm 50% confident because I just know my abilities as a human. Mm -hmm. Um, And then 50% like, oh my gosh, I need to make sure, just that thinking, I need to make sure that I am on point and all my I's are dotted and my T's crossed. Um, That by itself was already, you could say a little bit of a burden that I came in with wanting to prove myself, wanting to make sure that I did everything right. So then coming from the outside, you had things like people questioning my work, right? I remember uh, my, uh, my, uh, my my last role was a, as a risk uh, technology analyst. So I would we would analyze technology being brought into the firm for um, like just security, legal risks. We had like eight to 10 like departments we had to talk to, but I worked for my team. We were the risk team. We made the final approval decisions, but then we liaised with these other teams to make the decision. But I noticed that, you know, when I would write a report or when I would collate information, there was, there were just certain people Mm -hmm. (laughs) who were scrutinizing my reports, scrutinizing my emails. Mm. Like if there was a period, I remember this particular woman, if there was a period out of place, (laughs) she would email me and tell me that there was a period out of place in my email. And I was like, in my mind, and so the hypervigilance 
then kicked in because I was internally unsure of myself in some ways. And then this person was providing evidence that I should be unsure of myself. So then what that does is, of course, this was before my learning how to be coached or being coached or becoming a coach. I would take the action of double checking, triple checking, not because it was necessary for the documentation that was being produced because it was all internal. Mm -hmm. None of this was client facing. So really where the periods were did not matter, Mm -hmm. but because just having someone point something like that out to you was just so jarring and upsetting, especially because I didn't work for their department. My, my boss had no problem with it. Thankfully, some other women have a, a situation where their boss is the one who's micromanaging and over scrutinizing their work. And so then I would like double check and triple check what I was doing or walking into work one day. And I don't even know if I ever wore open toed shoes, but having this HR person come to my team when my boss was away and like two of us, myself and my team member, we sat together and she was not a woman of color. And then giving us a lecture about open toed shoes. And we're like, who's looking at people's shoes? We are literally in the St. Louis, like our, 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 our location was like very internal. Nobody cared what we wore. Clients weren't coming to our location, but there were just all of these like little signs that people were watching you really closely that people were taking note of everything you were doing. And that makes you feel like prey. It makes you feel like every little thing you do matters. Every hair has to be in place. And without understanding that it was just um, oppression, it was just, you know, racism, sexism, all of the isms that were happening, I didn't have a way of creating safety for myself, of trusting that I was okay. I, I, I had to look to these external signs and they were the wrong signals. And hypervigilance, one thing hypervigilance will do for you is that it will make you focus on the wrong people. So at the same time that I had all these people who were picking at the unnecessary details and criticizing and things, I had a ton of allies, which I realized later in my journey as I moved up but when you're hyper vigilant, because you're trying to create safety, you keep your eyes on the on the saber tooth tiger, <laughs> and that is actually does not contribute to your success. The so you don't feel there, you don't feel any more safe focusing on the perceived saber tooth tiger, and correct. sometimes the saber tooth tiger is just like Annie in accounting, who's like who doesn't have anything better to do than try to criticize your grammar. You're missing a period. Oh, we have to send an email about this. That's I'm like, okay. Yeah. Um, so, and then the saber to tiger quote unquote keeps you distracted from mm-hmm. the positive contributions you could be making from the positive uh, connections you could be making from the people who actually appreciate your work and are busy giving you compliments and, um, recommending you behind your back it keeps you from cultivating those relationships which are some of the key strategies that you want to be taking you want to be acting on so that you can continue to advance your career so it's about redirecting your nervous system redirecting your brain and so tell me a little bit more about you know what really did help you I know you did you know choose the entrepreneurial right you the route and you Uh, started your own coaching practice, but I'm curious, what helped you inside Mm -hmm. that experience? Because, you know, I coach women who hate office politics. People are listening to this and they're they're like, yeah, I know what this is like. And I'm curious, what helped you? Yeah. So coaching helped me. So towards the end of my career, I left my job in 2020 to go full-time as a coach, Mm -hmm. Uh, but I had started really getting coached seriously the whole time. But like, the, I guess the, I guess the more powerful coaching really started in 2018 mm. um, when I joined our coaching community mm-hmm. and I started getting like some real serious coaching based on cognitive behavioral uh, theory. And it was like really powerful coaching. And I realized, oh, there are things that I can do. So one of the things that helped me was doing a lot of uh, nervous system work. Mm-hmm. I would literally be at work. <laughs> And I could feel my anxiety rising and I would get up, I'd go to the bathroom. I'd go to, there was one bathroom that was like way out of the way. Almost no one went to that bathroom and I'd sit on a stall and I would tap like emotional freedom technique. I would do tapping. It 
took me five minutes or three minutes, my nervous system will calm down. Yes. And so that awareness that, oh, I don't have to be afraid. Like nothing is really happening in my environment that requires this level of anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> Even though it's being triggered by these little things, there is no saber tooth tiger. So learning some nervous system techniques that could help me lower the initial trigger wherever I came from was super helpful. So that was the first thing too. I started cultivating relationships. So I do, I am good at cultivating relationships. Um, so I, I leaned into that. I'm an extrovert. And, um, I, I, you know, I guess from about age 16, I had read like Dale Carnegie's book, which of course there's some problematic parts about <laughs> how to make friends and influence people, but he sowed the seeds that relationships and connections were important. So I started, um, cultivating relationships and connections where I found them. So instead of well, trying to win over the people who were, uh, who had thoughts about me that weren't helpful, I leaned into people who were friendly and people who were open and people who were, who appreciated my work. I would call the guys in the networking department up and just say, hi, <laughs> you know, and all of that, there was, and there were plenty of those people. Once I was able to pivot my attention, there were plenty of those people. So I cultivated those relationships, um, I started asking, I started uh, opening, I guess you could say, trying to open up um, value for my department based on my own uh, contributions on my own work. And so within my department, we were evangelizing um, robotics process analysis. So which is like some kind of, basically you could say automation within the company. And so I started evangelizing outside of, even though that wasn't my role, I was making so many connections, I started evangelizing our, my department to other groups that I was in contact with. And so I really started opening up um, uh, parts of the company that wanted what we offered. And I loved that. That was great. I, I, got, I was recognized for that in those groups. And so then I went to my boss and I was like, hey, I'm opening up some of this, uh, these you know, requests. Can I own those requests as a portfolio? <laughs> um, of my own business that I'm bringing into the department. And he, well, said no and took my, all of my portfolio and gave it to someone else. And so I was like, oh, that's not cool. And I, so I had the conversation again. I said, really, I, okay, maybe not right now, but what about long-term? Cause I knew I could do this. I said, long-term as I open up these roles, can I, these opportunities, can I own my portfolio in the future? So like, let's make a plan for me to own a portfolio in the future. And the answer was again, no. Um, hmm. He was like, there's just really no room for you to move up in this department. <laughs> I was like, um, yeah, I that's, a, that's really disappointing. Very disappointing. Yeah. yeah. It's very disappointing. So what did you do? Um, I, I, I moved teams. Okay. So instead Got of it. leaning on the relationships I was cultivating to improve my department, I simply leaned on those relationships to move to a department where I would, I felt like I would have more opportunity. I think this is like a masterclass, by the way, what you just shared. So I'm going to recap. Number one, coaching helped you regain your nervous system regulation and be able to cultivate safety within you. You learned um, a really useful technique. It's some, a technique that I also teach my clients called emotional freedom technique. And just so you know, this technique is super simple. You can look it up on YouTube, like so many different videos teaching you how to do it. And it has been proven to help people uh, with, you know, normal amounts of anxiety all the way to veterans who have PTSD. So it's super effective and simple. I think it's it's definitely an example of self-directed neuroplasticity, you know, how you can rewire your brain. And yeah. another thing, I heard you say the third thing is you actively chose to lean on people who already trust and like you and, you know, you cultivated allies. And then the the biggest thing I heard is that you negotiated, you negotiated for a, a bigger opportunity. And I love that you negotiated from this value add perspective. Let me, how can I add more value to these different departments? How can we offer them more of the benefit that we're already creating in this current department? And unfortunately, your boss didn't see it the same way, but ultimately it was their loss because you got to vote with your feet. That's something that, you know, any woman can do. You can vote with your, like divorce is voting with your feet. And you can also vote with your feet within 
a company and that's what you did. Yes. Yes. And I, you know, I went, when we, when you and I, you know, were talking about, you know, doing this uh, episode, I was like, I wonder if I could have gotten a yes, if I'd worked with Jamie, if I knew Jamie at the time, because I really just asked and Mm -hmm. he said, no, Um, Mm -hmm. there was no in between. And I know you have Mm -hmm. techniques to sort of make that conversation more robust and more, uh, fuller and maybe more detailed and so I've always wondered what would have happened if I hadn't because I I didn't have any negotiation techniques I was just like well I'm gonna ask for this and see what happens Mm -hmm. um but yeah so just I just wanted to put that in there where I think there there is a possibility to negotiate with better skill that I did not have at the time but I, I mean yes I can offer you some ideas but at the end of the day aren't you glad oh yeah right aren't you glad that it was a no and it led you to the decisions and it led you to where you are now where you're able to help amazing mission driven women you know not just that actually the entire department Mm -hmm. was laid off Mm. about six months after I left got it so (laughs) (laughs) your timing you're asked you asking for it and then you making that decision based on the no it it what's the word it spared you it did it spared you from being laid off yes so, yes so at did. the end of the day it, it, it was a silver lining <laughs> yes 100 percent. everything yeah. worked out perfectly I was very yeah. happy with the outcome yeah love that so we don't need to change what has already happened but for the sake of people who are listening to this, for the sake of people who are wondering, okay, if the circumstances were slightly different, more favorable, and I wanted to negotiate slightly in a more, um, what's the right word, in a strategic way, I would just advise um, getting really curious and asking questions ahead of time about, hey, what are your top concerns right now, decision maker, or even thinking through by leveraging the network that you do have, asking around and maybe have conversation with the HR person, maybe have a chat with the finance person and sort of mm-hmm. trying to get the lay of the uh, of, of the uh, the land yes. so to speak like hey what's going on what what's the what's the murmur <laughs> right and what seems to be um the core concerns of people making mm. these decisions and then from that information you can also you know just as you said earlier taking stock of your wins right really allowing yourself to feel good about your own accomplishments and your contributions and being able to convey that Mm-hmm. In, a, in a in a again in a strategic way in a way that is aligned with what the decision maker most cares about and and I just want to say sometimes the decision maker isn't your direct boss sometimes mm-hmm. it's their skip level boss or their skip skip uh, level boss right yeah. and sometimes like thinking about okay how do I tell her that message so that it really lands with them so that even if I have this conversation with my direct boss, they can relay something that will have their ears perking up. Yeah. I hear you saying I, I, if I'd had a bigger perspective, yes, I might've had more information that could have led to a yes. Yeah. But at the end, again, at the end of the day, you're really glad it was a no. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, for sure I am. Yeah. And, you know, and it, it, it could have been a yes and I could have still left, you know? Yes, that's true. Yeah, that's yeah. True. but yeah, but thank you for sharing that because I think that really does help because I think that sometimes we take it personally. We feel like, oh, mm. it was about me. Mm. It was about something I did or they, my mm. boss didn't like me or my boss just didn't want me. Mm. But maybe there just wasn't enough information on the table. Maybe there were variables that we didn't take into consideration that we um, that we can learn the skill of collecting as well. And I'd imagine that you do something similar when you uh, coach someone to date better, right? I oh, yeah. I saw that you you gave a workshop on how to date with your values, right? So again, mm-hmm. it's sort of that information gathering or clarifying ahead of a decision-making conversation, right? Yes. Whether it's a workplace <laughs> negotiation, whether it's like, hey, let's go out on a date, right? It's like, are we coming to that conversation prepared, being clear on what's most important to us and what we, what, and are we getting curious about 
what they most care about, what, what they value so that we can yeah. arrive at value alignment. So I know there are people who do a lot of these like dating analogies with negotiation and not to make it all about mm-hmm. dating or, well, <laughs> what am I trying to say? We have a dating coach on the podcast. What I'm trying to say is uh, um, sometimes when we think about dating for women, I think we kind of run the risk of um, thinking about our values in a, in a, in a different way, as opposed to our professional value and a perceived value. So, so I, and I think it's the same. I agree with you. It's all the same, but somehow Mm -hmm. we, it's, it's like, and I think it's actually easier for women to bring all of who they are to the professional arena Mm -hmm. because the professional arena seems to have a lot more room Mm -hmm. Like, okay, if it's not this company, it might be another company or things like that. So we're like, okay, yeah, there's a place where I would fit. Okay. But it's a mistake to not think that way when you're dating. Because what happens because of just the the gender narrative we've had for thousands of years, Hmm. women have been conditioned to force themselves to fit with whichever man is in the arena at Mm. that moment. But it's the same thing. Bring all of yourself to every dating encounter. Mm-hmm. And if it's not a fit, there is a place where there is a fit for you. Yeah, got it. Okay, so in that in that sense, it's the same, yes. And then, yeah. and then of course, there are differentiations because we're not having a compensation conversation with you. <laughs> okay. Well, we're having a chore conversation. Who's doing the chores around here? <laughs> mm, actually, now that, now that you mentioned it, that could lead to because you know we do know that women do a lot of domestic chores and mm-hmm. unpaid labor so yes. okay so in that in that sense how you negotiate with your romantic partner it may not be immediately financial but i think it can have an impact on your overall satisfaction the quality of your life right yes, yes. and as just well like as, in the workplace yeah you're dealing with someone who's been socialized a certain way as well Mm. through no fault of his, if it's Mm. a man, you know, they have been socialized a certain way as well. So like, so now you're dealing with your own socialization that, Hey, I don't have to do all the chores. Mm. And then you're dealing with the fact that he's been socialized to not do any chores. Mm. (laughs) And so really it is a negotiation. It is a conversation. And I encourage my clients to have those conversations early Mm-hmm. Not from a demand perspective, but from a communicating expect of uh, expectations early, yeah. so that by the third date or the fourth date, a man knows the kind of person that you are and the kind of relationship you're looking for, mm-hmm. so you don't get six months in and find out that it's not a fit. Yeah, you know, you just reminded me very early in my career. I'm a South Korean immigrant. I did work in Korean companies, and there was this unspoken assumption, this unspoken rule that the women staff would prepare coffee or mm-hmm. tea. And I resented that so much because I had a feminist education at Smith College. And I'm like, no way, I'm not going to, no, that's not right. And so just like you mentioned, I realized from that experience that working in an Asian company is not a fit for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So thank you. Thank you for that. So um, is there anything else that we haven't yet addressed that you want to make sure that we do address here? Um, I think what I will say is like applicable in leadership and the workplace and in dating is just for women to understand that you've got to go on this journey of reclaiming your sovereignty and autonomy just yeah. as a mindset. Like, yeah. You know, we were born with it and then it got taken away somewhere along the way. And there are very few people who don't have to reset and ask themselves the question, do I live as though I belong to myself? Oh, that's so I good. live <laughs> as if I belong to everybody who randomly comes my way or my parents or my kids or my husband or my partner or my boss? How am I living? And really asking yourself that question and becoming aware of um, how sovereign you are because you really, you belong to you. You belong to you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You, you know, so good. This is, it, you're happier. <laughs> you're happier. I think when you live that way. 
Yes. And in fact, there is a concept called tiara syndrome that I teach. It's mm -hmm. from negotiation scholar Carol Frolinger and Deborah Kolb of Harvard University. And they talk about tiara syndrome, which is when you keep your head down and do good work, waiting for somebody else to reward you, someone else to give you the recognition, but the tiara never arrives because that's the reality of this world. We don't live in a Disney fairy tale. And so how do we combat the tiara syndrome? We own our self-sovereignty, just as you said, is like we put our own crown on. We belong to ourselves, our yeah. value. We get to own that first for ourselves. And then that's when we can ask for the things that we want, whether that is in divorce, whether that is in a dating relationship, and even when it is in a workplace conversation. Yeah. Jenny, in the you have... world, uh, we call it no one's coming to save you. Oh my gosh, it's the same thing in the working world. No one's coming to save you. I think that's going to be like the title of this podcast. No one's coming to save you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. Where can people go to learn more about you and your amazing coaching work? Uh, yes. Yeah. So I work with uh, divorced women, typically right around 40 and above mission minded women, ambitious, successful, who are wanting partnership and companionship. So if anyone is interested in that work, one of the best places to hang out with me is on my podcast. It is the Dating After Divorce podcast with Shadi Curry. It is on all the um, podcast platforms and Google you can find me at my website, shadecurry.com. Uh, Shade is spelled S-A-D-E, so there's no H in there, S-A-D-E-C-U-R-R-Y.com. And you can find my uh, my podcast there, my a description of my work, other presentations that I've done. Um, and then just on all the socials, just at Shade Curry on Instagram, Shade Curry Life Coach on Facebook. Thank you so much, Shade. Thank you, Jamie.